Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Steve Grundman. I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council, and I am pleased to be your host for this afternoon's event, uh, which launches, rolls out the State of the Space Industrial Base for 2022 report. Uh, this is a report that carries the title, Winning the New Space Race for Sustainability, Prosperity, and the Planet. And we here at the Atlantic Council are very pleased uh, to be the host of this event. We are not, as it happens, the author of the report. Uh, the report is the work of a collaboration between US Space Force, uh, the Air Force Research Labs, and the Defense Innovation Unit. And there will be representatives from all three of those organizations um, here on the event today. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, space is, is a, uh, an, a, an area, a field, a domain, uh, uh, ever more contested, as, as we all know that is of special interest and attention here at the Atlantic Council. So when we were approached to host this event, uh, I was more than happy to do it. Um, here's how this is gonna go. Uh, we run the event for 90 minutes or at this point, 88. Uh, the event will run from now until the bottom of the next hour, 3.30 Eastern time. And it's uh, essentially got three parts to it. Uh, after I'm done speaking, I will introduce uh, Mike Brown, the director of DIU, the Defense Innovation Unit, whom we have asked and we're very pleased to have to give some uh, keynote remarks, uh, setting the stage and setting the tone uh, for the conversation that follows. The conversation that follows uh, will be a panel discussion among three of the report's authors together with Mandy Vaughn, the CEO and founder of GXO, um, who will form a panel moderated by our non-resident senior fellow, Mir Sadat. And that will be the body of this event. It'll run for about uh, an hour, I would guess, uh, toward the end of which, uh, in the last 15 or 20 minutes, we will be pleased to take questions from those of you who are here in the audience. Um, uh, you will be able to get your questions into the queue uh, by using the Q&A function of, of, of Zoom. If you see it down there, at least the way my uh, Zoom uh, screen is laid out, you'll see a little Q&A tab at the bottom. Um, that's the way to offer a question uh, my colleague, uh, Julia Siegel, uh, will, will consider and curate those questions. And when the time comes, somewhere around 10 or 15 minutes after uh, the top of the next hour, we'll be able to get questions um, to the panel from those of you in the audience. I strongly encourage you to do so. Um, the only uh, requirement uh, might be two. Uh, one is that you identify yourself and, and where you're writing in from. Um, it's important to mention that this is a fully open and on the record event. Um, and uh, as, as, as befits uh, such a, uh, a standard, uh, we want to know uh, who's, who's uh, giving, even, even if it's Julia who's giving voice to your question, who the, who the question is coming from. Um, the other thing, uh, the other requirement of a good question is that it be short and that it, it, uh, it get on point uh, pretty quickly, which will make it easier uh, for those of uh, the rest of you in the audience to, to get it and to get through lots of questions and for the panelists to be able to address the question uh, both themselves concisely and also on point. Um, uh, that is the agenda of this event. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention for now, for those of you who are uh, dialing in, uh, logging into the Atlantic Council for the first time, is uh, what the Atlantic Council is and the Scowcroft Center. And uh, the Atlantic Council is a think tank uh, which works with the Atlantic community to shape the global future together. Uh, it's based here in Washington, but it has operations and interest all across uh, the globe. Again, the Atlantic Council uh, name notwithstanding, um, it has important uh, and deep uh, uh, programming in, in every region of, of the globe, as well as uh, a half dozen or so functional areas like um, energy and certainly, uh, and, and most especially, and even most traditionally, uh, in security, in international security. Indeed, this uh, event and my fellowship uh, is being brought to you by the Scowcroft Center on Strategy and Security. Uh, this is the place within the Atlantic Council which uh, develops sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the world. The sort of issues that are raised in this report on the state of the space industrial base 2022 um, are exactly um, those kinds of important security challenges facing this country and the world. And uh, that's why, as, as I've said, uh, I myself and on behalf of the Atlantic Council am so pleased to be hosting this event. All right, well, let's get to it. Uh, I said that the next part of our agenda was my introducing Mike Brown, uh, the director of the Defense Innovation Unit. 
Uh, Mike's going to give us some keynote remarks. Um, DIU, as, as some of you may not know, um, was established in 2015 um, to help the DOD field leading edge commercial capabilities uh, quicker and more cost effectively than traditional defense acquisition methods uh, might otherwise make possible. Um, Mike uh, got into the government, so far as I can tell, Mike, uh, in 2016, when he was appointed the White House Presidential Innovation Fellow at the DOD, uh, during which time, uh, among other things, he wrote or co-wrote a study on China's participation in the U.S. venture ecosystem, um, a very impactful study that led to, among other things, the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act uh, amendments to the uh, uh, CFIUS law, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. Um, but he's done a bunch of other things outside of government for that, before that. Most, most notably, he was the CEO of Semantic Corporation, a leader in cybersecurity. Uh, and then back a number of years before that, the CEO of Quantum Corporation, uh, which was a leading company in the computer storage industry. Um, Mike, we in the defense establishment um, are really uh, pleased to have you here, but also uh, grateful uh, for your service, uh, both in the DIU uh, and at the DOD beforehand. Um, it's one of the great uh, uh, privileges and relationships uh, with Silicon Valley, if I can embody you that way, uh, that, that, that the, DO, the DOD has, has benefited from over the last uh, six to eight years when this has been a high priority of the DOD. So welcome. Um, the podium is yours to set the tone and the stage for our discussion about this report. Well, Stephen, thanks for that uh, very kind introduction, and thanks to the Atlantic Council for hosting us today. Uh, as Stephen said, I'm uh, the director of the Defense Innovation Unit, uh, and we're excited today to be introducing the State of the Space Industrial Base Report for 2022, which is co-sponsored by United States Space Force, Air Force Research Laboratory, and the Defense Innovation Unit. This is a collaboration, not just for this year, but in previous years, uh, but provides a comprehensive look at whether the developing industrial base for space is what we need for our future in space. You know, when I was a boy, winning the space race was a national goal that captured the imagination of almost every American. We had a national purpose in developing the science and technology necessary to do something truly monumental in mankind's history, put a man on the moon. While we were focused at that time on the science and technology development, we couldn't have known how critical our investments would be as a foundation for our nation's future economic prosperity. Even in the face of that historic achievement of landing a man on the moon, our government was balancing the short-term priorities and the administration was deciding whether to dismantle the Apollo program or severely reduce spending. However, what we now know is that this investment in space led to the development of entire industries like semiconductors, software, advanced communications, and high-performance computing, which have delivered prosperity for the nation through global industry leadership for the 50 years since the Apollo 11 moon landing. This is an important lesson for the U.S. government budget trade-offs we face today and our harbinger that investments made for space today will pay dividends in the future. Today, we're in a second space race with a much more capable competitor than the Soviet Union, China, which already enjoys a much larger economy than the Soviets had at their peak relative to the US. China is focused on the importance of superiority in space and launched more rockets last year than we did and the year before that. Many of the experts assembled for the conference that created this report know that China could surpass the US in space superiority if we do not increase our investments. Our host today, the Atlantic Council, agrees with that assessment. As President Kennedy was preparing to say the day he was assassinated in 1963, the United States has no intention of finishing second in space. The effort is expensive, but it pays its own way for freedom and for America. His words are just as true today but we will not get there without a national prioritized effort, which this report calls for. The report shows us the way, how to prevent a second place finish, but it also points that we need to gather the political will for a national vision and sustain a multi-generational investment. 
You'll hear today about the report recommendations, including the need for that national vision and the required investments. However, the key difference between uh, today and that earlier space race is the profound impact of private investment and commercial companies. These private companies are proliferating technologies enabling responsive launch at a fraction of earlier costs and more sensors than we could have dreamed of a few years ago. These space-based sensors will provide both a resilient network for global communications, as well as close to real-time situational awareness of our Earth. Fortunately for us, private investment makes this space race much more affordable than the last space race, where we allocated 5% of the federal budget to put a man on the moon. That would be a political impossibility today. Last week, I visited several rocket and small satellite manufacturers in Los Angeles, where innovation abounds with the 3D printing of rocket motors and new sensors in space proliferating in numbers several orders of magnitude more than those on government satellites. With the dramatic increase of satellites in low Earth orbit, one estimate is that there will be 1,000 commercial satellites in space for every government satellite by the end of this decade. It's an exciting time to be in the space industry since there are so many new companies and capabilities being ready for use. Therefore, what's required to win the space race today is a strengthening of public-private partnership, which emphasizes commercial technology over bespoke government design, government built, and government sustained systems. Our government must buy what it can and only build what it must to sustain leadership in space in the decades ahead. In addition to encouraging private investment, the role of government is to provide the infrastructure to make these companies successful. This is what we've done historically when the US government took responsibility for building the transcontinental railroad or the interstate highway system. By providing the foundational investments as well as timely regulation, the US government thereby encourages private investment. President Biden's national defense strategy prioritizes this activity under the heading building an enduring advantage. Relative to our recent history in the US, we need to be much more aggressive with our investments in space infrastructure, both physical and digital, that will allow private companies to build on a strong foundation. <clears throat> we need to provide government contract revenue to support the companies building this uh, future in space. And at the Defense Innovation Unit, we've seen private investors follow our prototype contracts to invest $40 in equity for every $1 we write in prototype contracts for companies in the space uh, sector. The private market is ready to invest if we provide the signal that a market is important for the US government and that that market will benefit from government investment. And what if we don't provide this government investment? Without this foundational investment that encourages follow on private capital, we will see China set the standards, create the companies, and achieve the technology first associated with creating a $10 trillion space based economy. Imagining such a world where autocracies like China and Russia can exert their power over the world's economy, information, resources, and our environment is incompatible with our American ethos. Winning the new space race is not about defeating competitors, rather it's about sustaining our leadership in space that assures liberty and prosperity for all who choose it. Securing this future for our grandchildren and their grandchildren should be our generation's legacy. This State of the Space Industrial, Port, State of the space Industrial Base report emphasizes the urgency required to address the challenges to the international order and calls for the investments to prevent a second place finish in space. What we know after winning the first space race is that investments we make today create an entirely new economic frontier for our future. I encourage you to read the report and participate in the SSIB workshops with us and hosted by our partners like New Space New Mexico that assess and shape the United States future in space. Thank you very much. Steve, let me turn it back over to you. Okay, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for DIU's uh, leadership on this, on this report and the workshops that lead to it. Um, 
In my uh, introductory remarks, I failed to mention that all of you uh, can read this report. It's a really, it's a remarkably uh, impressive and in-depth report based on uh, workshops that happened just a couple months ago. So kudos to those authors who worked so hard to pull this together in a short period of time. Um, there, uh, the DIU uh, is hosting uh, the document and uh, there is a link uh, to it that has been posted. My colleague, Julia Siegel has posted a link to it in the, um, in the chat function here, uh, but I'm sure it is searchable uh, at this uh, point as well uh, through your web browser. Um, let's turn now to the panel discussion. Um, I will introduce only briefly uh, those who comprise the panel and turn it over to my, my friend and colleague, Mir Sadat, uh, to tell us more. The panel comprises Major General John Olson, uh, Mobilization Assistant to the Chief of Space Operations and one of the report's authors. Uh, Steve, uh, he goes by Bucky uh, Butow, Director of DIU's Space Portfolio, also one of the authors of the report, and Colonel Eric Felt, uh, another of the report's authors. Uh, he is the Director of Architecture, Science, and Technology for the U.S. Air Force's Space Acquisition and Integration. Not least, Mandy Vaughn, uh, whom I've already mentioned, the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of GXO Incorporated. Um, she's on the panel, too. The panel is being moderated by uh, Mir Sadat. Mir is a non-resident senior fellow um, here at the Atlanta Council. He has 25 years of experience in uh, both private industry, higher education, and the US government to include service on the National Security Council. He's the founding editor-in-chief of the journal Dauntless, an adjunct scholar at the Modern War Institute at West Point, and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Uh, most recently, uh, Mir has himself been the author of two reports uh, on space uh, in 2021. He was the co-author of U.S. Space Policies for the New Space Age, Competing on the Final Economic Frontier. And this year, just last month, uh, and uh, he, he was the co-author with, again, Julia, uh, on uh, of a report entitled, an Atlanta Council report entitled Space Traffic Management, Time for Action, uh, which we uh, already is out, but we'll be launching uh, at an event on the 14th of September that I hope many of you in the audience will return to the Atlanta Council to watch. Um, Mir, panel, thank you all for coming and for the hard work it took getting here. Um, let's have a great discussion about this. Thank you, Steve. And uh, thank you, Mike, for those opening remarks, really um, set the context for our discussion. So let me just uh, do a quick recap of where we were from the last time we rolled this out. A lot has changed in the world and in space and a lot has still remained uh, constant since we last hosted th th this report for 2021 last year. Uh, we see more countries signing on to NASA's Artemis program. Uh, Russia announced they are leaving the ISS, then they changed their mind. And then I think last week they're changing their mind again. So they're, they're kind of still changing their opinions. Uh, the Chinese are continuing to steal US technologies and advanced hypersonic vehicles. Russia is Again, acting not just recklessly in space by trolling our satellites and, and ASAT tests, but now also continuing that great march of recklessness on land with the invasion of Ukraine that has now, you know, almost reaching a half year point. Um, we see discussions like, uh, like you said, Steve, on SSA, STM, what do they mean? How do they work together? How do they converge? What's the Hill going to do about this, if anything? Um, and we're still debating things on whether uh, state space um, spacecraft and space derived uh, capabilities are part of our critical infrastructure, or are they just critical capabilities? And of course, the most important thing that has happened so far is that the DoD set up the anomaly surveillance and resolution office, uh, basically UFO office, um, and uh, NASA has committed to helping explain UAPs or UFOs. Uh, so for the fourth year in a row, New Space New Mexico hosted the state of the space industrial base uh, with participants across the government, uh, private industry, and think tanks, and leading academics participated. Um, and I just want to give a quick shout out to New Space New Mexico because they are a space organization that focuses on both uniting and igniting the space ecosystem, and they've done a phenomenal job in uh, New Mexico and um, as well as supporting these uh, different organizations in the government that support space. Um, and for recordings of that um, event, uh, you can go to newspacenewmexico.org uh, so you can download uh, and view each of those uh, events. Um, <clears throat> so let me just jump right into this because we got a little bit uh, less than you know 40 minutes or so. Um, Bucky, first question to you. 
for the fourth year in a row, you've co-sponsored uh, the state of the space industrial uh, industrial base seminar, and a report came out. Um, what recommendations have remained the same since the other report, and why haven't they changed? Well, I, I think uh, first, just as to set the tone, uh, a lot has changed in, in the last year. And I want to give you uh, just a quick rundown of of some of the most significant things that we've all witnessed together. Um, not the least of which, in the commercial side, seven companies went public. Uh, and uh, in 2021, we had a record setting $15 billion of private investment go into the commercial space sector, which is almost twice uh, what happened the year prior to that. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, Ukraine. Um, the uh, use of commercial space capabilities, both uh, satellite imagery and broadband communications, have uh, fundamentally been contributing to the uh, to uh, Ukraine's a successful, you know, uh, uh, repulsion of, of the of the Russian invasion. Uh, we have uh, policy. Uh, the U.S. Space Party's uh, framework uh, came out uh, just in December. Uh, we've got uh, national strategies for in space uh, servicing, uh, assembly and manufacturing, and also uh, orbital uh, debris mitigation. Um, oh, but also we are on the commercial side. We have uh, meaningful contracts. Uh, awarded by the uh, National Reconnaissance Office to uh, to uh, companies who uh, who can now plan for the future because they are actually part of the of the government enterprise, uh, really validating um, this whole quote of buy what you can and build what you must. On other fronts, uh, we started a hybrid space architecture uh, with uh, with the U.S. Space Force and AFRL, a phenomenal project to uh, create digital infrastructure in space. James Webb Space Telescope, uh, uh, amazing images, uh, the most exquisite complex spacecraft we probably ever put in space, deploys flawlessly and is returning images, uh, uh, which are just uh, uh, shocking to the ima imagination and inspiring a whole generation of new folks uh, to study space. And, uh, and of course, we're T minus one week away from the Artemis One, uh, which is also another exquisite capability uh, that's going to really put uh, uh, the the first woman and uh, next human of of color on on the uh, surface of the moon eventually. Uh, this being the formal kickoff of that campaign, so Artemis will cease to be a PowerPoint uh, uh, capability. It'll be a real capability, an operational capability, just uh, within a week away. So, so amazing accomplishments and uh, all that collectively and more reasserts that the United States is unmatched in its space capabilities uh, today. Um, the focus of the report, uh, which is very interesting from a government standpoint, is you know, we actually pulsed the industrial base to say uh, with, with the question, uh, are, are, we, are, we making, uh, are we making good progress uh, in our, in our uh, efforts to retain our, our leadership position in space? If not, why not? And most people agree on, on the recommendations that we should, uh, but they also agree that we're not moving fast enough, uh, not across the whole spectrum. And so most of the report uh, details areas where, where we can do better, areas where we are doing very well, and, uh, and then uh, suggestions, uh, recommendations and action items as to how we can actually uh, improve and retain that leadership well in the future. So, uh, and. The number one recommendation uh, uh, for, I think our second or third year in a row, is really the uh, idea that the uh, United States should establish a grand strategy uh, for, uh, for, for space uh, and America's future in it, not just for uh, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, but for the 21st century. And uh, by painting that long range vision, and uh, we can roadmap to how we achieve that space future, uh, which is most desirable to not just uh, our space accomplishments, but the preservation of, of our, our values, uh, our democratic principles, and a uh, international liberal order, which is how uh, our nation states are all organized around the planet. So I'll just leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you. That was a great uh, recap of uh, all the moving parts as well. Thank you so much for that. Save the question. <laughs> um, Eric, how are this year's recommendation uh, sort of different or uh, 
more evolved than previous years. Mayor, we saw this year a repeat of a lot of the recommendations that we had seen before. And the, the consensus of the audience that was there and the participants were that, uh, that those uh, strategic and hard things to do had still not made enough progress there and that we needed to, to double down and keep after some of those very important, although not easy, recommendations. And so we have made a lot of progress over the last year, but if you just look at the uh, actual recommendations that are in there, a lot of them are the same because we still have a long ways to go in a lot of these areas. A lot of the rec uh, many of the recommendations, such as having uh, establishing this North Star vision for space, uh, require a lot of coordination between different departments of the government. And of course, that that's always a challenge, but it's but it's absolutely essential if we want to win this space race and out innovate our peer competitors. So I, I think at the top level, you see a lot of similarities to the recommendations we saw in previous years. At this conference this year, we got into a lot more details about uh, exactly how to proceed, what are some of the baby steps along the way. Uh, you know, For example, uh, very clear that the DOD needs to buy more commercial services faster. And if we do that, it will be very beneficial to the both the department and to the commercial services as we help shape that market. So specific recommendations like that, uh, although they were in previous years, are now at a higher level of detail that'll be even more actionable for the affected departments and for the government and for the companies involved. Thank you, Eric. No, that's great. Um, Mandy, uh, you are not shy at all. Um, so I'm gonna turn, turn this question over to you. Uh, what do you think is missing from the report? Oh, shoot. I was going to go with the other one first, but let's see. So first, I want to say thank you to the Atlantic Council, DIU, AFRL, and the authors for letting me be kind of an industry voice to, to join the group here. So thanks for, for taking the time. Um, one thing I want to say just in terms of, of for the audience uh, that that's good about the report is um, I can't impart enough to industry participants that the authors of this report really do solicit feedback from the industry participants. Uh, join the workshops. Your voice is actually really important to the plenary sessions here. And one thing that I really liked in the report this year was that survey that Bucky mentioned. Um, so a lot of the industry participants, uh, I thought this was kind of, this was illuminate, illuminating in terms of what did they think were self-identified as good innovation, underlying technology and entrepreneurship, and then what did they rank kind of in the industrial base that was bad? Incentives, incentive alignment, supply chain, human capital, supporting legislation, and strategy. So I'll, I'll come back to that throughout. But I thought just even that, that the results of that poll were very, very illuminating. So what do I think is missing from the report? Uh, Colonel Felt started to kind of hit on it a little bit here, and, and you dove right in. But the recommendations haven't necessarily changed too materially over the last few years. So while I agree with Colonel Felt's assessment that it's because in some ways we it, there's obviously more work to do, but I think it's one area where I think we as the community that's worked on this report, we owe it to ourselves a little bit more on the why. Why have those recommendations not changed? And maybe a challenge back as to maybe a little time-based analysis on where can we articulate that it's working and not working. So a couple other big rocks that I think are missing from the report, uh, as Bucky mentioned with the hybrid space architecture, there is a lot of talk in the report on the outer net and kind of moving the internet into space and, and what does that look like? And I think that's a great add and a great take on the, space, the hybrid space architecture, but I think it's more fundamental in terms of what does this just mean for future G? What does this mean for 6G and, and beyond? And how do we link what we need for the hybrid space architecture to a much more fundamental national, not just DOD emphasis and leadership role. So I think that's one thing, which that linkage back to that national leadership role is kind of my next theme, that the, the report needs to link to the larger innovation ecosystem conundrum. Um, we just can't solve this for space. We can try to solve this for space, but the underlying core tech, um, Mike Brown mentioned it in his remarks, microelectronics, those supply chain concerns, human capital, those things we as just our little space ecosystem are, are kind of still a bit player within. 
So I think it really is how do we get to that larger, how do we tie our recommendations and, and what are those fundamental things like the 6G example and, and that level of innovation and leadership? How do we tie that back to the overall national strategy and the department strategy? Thank you, Mandy. John, um, you know, you've know you served in and out of uh, uniform in uh, various capacities um, throughout the government and private sector. Uh, what what should readers do with this report, right? I mean, what what should readers in private industry and in different parts of the government? You've worked in the White House. You've worked, you know, you're in, assigned to Space Force right now. You've worked in different. You've been in the Air Force, um, private sector. What what? How do people operationalize this report? Well, I think that's the great question. I mean, frankly, we had 250 participants in the two workshops that we had, and. And as we look at that, it's just a phenomenal uh, opportunity for us to hear the, the direct inject uh, from a very uh, rich, robust, and diverse set of people. So as we look at that, we, we find these, uh, particularly in the way that the forum, uh, the, the forum and the plenaries are put together and, and the actionable inputs, they're all amalgamated in this report in order to serve as, as, as an unfiltered and, 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 a, and a robust body of inputs. It's precisely that level of diverse and, and, and driven and dynamic inputs that helps us, uh, whether in, in any of the government echelons, uh, whether at the headquarters level or whether at the uh, field and operational uh, echelons to really understand, ingest and, and, and uh, add Add to the mix and 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 fuel the discussions. As we look at uh, these this level of inputs, we find uh, that many uh, many of the criticisms that we hear about a lack of progress are 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 are, are, are well known. Uh, activities uh, are underway in many of these areas. As we've talked about, uh, we've we've seen tremendous progress in the space force. As we look at just being two and a half years old with the birth date. Uh, of 20, uh, 20 December 2019, as we look at the evolution, this is the year of implementation. General Raymond and the Space Force are, are vigorously focused on a resilient and effective architecture. As we look at NASA, there's been extraordinary strides, as, as Bucky aptly mentioned, um, some big wins as we get towards uh, looking at uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, as we look at uh, the continuing efforts to build towards this Artemis One launch as we look at the sustainment of, of the International Space Station, as we look at the rich tapestry across uh, the crude and uncrewed side of that, both NASA and the, the, the Space Force are, are, are vigorously for, uh, focused on advancing the ball. But these things do take time. And, 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 and I think uh, as we work through that process, we collectively feel the sense of urgency. We feel the sense of compelling uh, action here. And as we take these inputs um, in, in, in each successive year, uh, having that having that body of, of, of work, which is really well documented and, and bringing the subject matter experts to bear is, is, is something that helps us uh, with much more uh, adaptive, uh, responsive actions drive forward these collective interests that we all hold vitally important to our, not only our national, but our partners and allies throughout the globe. As we look at this uh, space race or this new space race, if you will, it is all about the whole of nation approach. And this is a great opportunity for us to get the best inputs from industry, academia, non-governmental organizations, and other uh, concerned citizens. Thank you, John. Uh, follow on question to you, John. Um, with the release of uh, what Bucky mentioned, the U.S. national policy on uh, in-space service assembly manufacturing and also uh, the previous uh, Space Force um, Space Power Doctrine document on space mobility and logistics, uh, it's clear that these are these are like sort of recognized as two important areas right, for growth. What inputs from that um, uh, industrial base uh, symposium were most relevant uh, and potentially enabling for these causes? I don't think it's, uh, I, I, I think they're all, uh, they're all valuable. I think the sectors, and we added uh, two this year, we added, I, I, I believe, human capital, and uh, we added uh, the, 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 the space, further on the space industrial base. But, you know, as we look at those, um, 
these are uh, these are fundamentally important as we look at the, the people in the programs uh, and the policies. As we, uh, I, I think, what we also uh, should recognize is, is that just this year alone, uh, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy came out uh, with the um, the In Space Servicing Assembly and and, and Manufacturing or ISAM implementation, uh, the the policy and the implementation plan is work. The orbital debris remediation. Um, uh, implementation plan is 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 uh, with us. The uh, U.S. Space uh, Priorities Framework document out of the National Space uh, Space Council. All of these, I think, uh, were were definitely imbued with a strong sense of of of, of this uh, vigorous set of inputs. I think our 2021 report was uh, was useful in that in, in that regard. Certainly, we within the Space Force take these seriously, and we also. Um, further invest in the dialogue and the engagement at the public-private policy uh, discussion level. And so I think collectively, uh, I think we've had an impact. I think that's important. And that's really what the richness of our, of our national approach is as a democracy, where we take the inputs, as we take uh, the diverse uh, in a diverse level of, of, of focus areas and, 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 and build on the innovative and entrepreneurial spirit of our nation. I think that's how we compete by harnessing that true whole of nation approach. Thank you, John. Uh, Bucky, quick question for you. Um, for our audience who doesn't, uh, who might not be aware of how the symposium works, how did you select the people? How did people nominate themselves? If there are people out there that want to contribute to next year, how can they get in touch or participate, or is it an invite-only list? No, absolutely. They uh, they can register online, um, and we uh, we offer the workshop in in two ways: uh, in person. You know, post COVID, we can actually get together again. So uh, we have an in person venue, and and venues. Uh, I'll get back to that in a sec. And we can do it just like we're doing right now. We have a virtual um, uh, thing. So we're always going to do this uh, hybrid. Uh, workshop to make it mo more convenient uh, for people. The, you know, the industrial base is very busy and uh, we don't want them to spend their valuable time and money uh, away from doing important things that we need for the country. Uh, one of the things we did, and John actually highlighted this, is we actually had a workshop in at Cape Canaveral focused on launch and then the rest of the body met in, a, in a Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, uh, which is kind of ground zero for for this workshop for the last couple of years. And uh, next year, we're gonna try to expand that out to other, other centers of innovation in this, in this space um, um, enterprise. So, uh, so more work to be done on that. And a large part, we wanna do whatever we can to, to have more uh, access uh, for the industrial base. So we get more meaningful input and, uh, and, then, uh, and then also, um, Make sure that we're reflecting the whole industry, not just a portion of it. Um, we, if we do any editing, it's we don't want too many uh, govies uh, like me. <laughs> so, uh, so we get the we get, uh, but it's important. We get we get uh, folks who come in like with lots of different experience, but we don't we we don't want to just recycle what the government wants to hear. Uh, it's really important, as Mandy said, uh, that we we give the you know be willing and able to give the microphone over to industry and 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 collect all the input that we get. Uh, so that's that's kind of the the art of it. It's kind of worked out um, uh, uh, surprisingly well over the last couple of years, and uh, and and it's only going to improve as we do it again next year. Thank you, Bucky. And I got a follow on. Um, you know, we're all watching sort of the evolution of uh, Starship with great amazement, um, and you're over at Defense Innovation Unit, so you're you know out there on tip of the spear with all this innovation and technology. Is there mm -hmm. anything you can talk to us about? What other sort of new transformational capabilities? are on the horizon or are like almost there for us to witness um, sort of whet our appetite for our national security. Yeah, well, you know, uh, Starship is fascinating to uh, many folks. I, you know, the, uh, before I talk about that, that, you know, when we look at innovation, we, uh, uh, those in the innovation space, we look at uh, really, there's three tiers of innovation. Uh, the first tier is quality. You know, it's, it's one thing to make one, um, satellite, but can you make uh, a thousand satellites that all behave the same way? And there's a lot of innovation that goes into quality, uh, which is very important to us. Uh, the, the next tier of innovation is agility. So once you've made that that product uh, and you could do it at scale, uh, 
how do you have a, a, a rhythm to uh, to enhance that technology and, and get more improvements out? And we're seeing that across uh, the entirety of the of the space uh, uh, industrial base because most most of the companies we work with are in a, uh, they adopt and use a, a, a lean agile approach to uh, developing and, and fielding capabilities. The third tier of innovation is disruption, and and that's what's uh, that's what uh, uh, what the Starship uh, represents. It, it represents a disruptive technology that, if successful, uh, would provide a path to tr transform heavy lift to space at a much more affordable price uh, using a fully reusable launch vehicle, which is uh, very, very, very difficult. Uh, the uh, at the same time, uh, it's uh, it's causing a reaction across the launch uh, enterprise, and so other companies are introducing reusable launch vehicles. Which is great. It, it, it reduces a lot of debris and uh, and a lot of the other environmental impacts that uh, that would come from just having expendable rockets. Uh, but it also transforms uh, has the potential to transform global mobility, which uh, AFRL uh, is actually exploring. And so, how can we rapidly move uh, cargo from one place of the Earth to the other? Uh, and of course, NASA is sees this as a disruptive way to deliver a lot of that cargo uh, to destinations like the Moon. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it's uh, it's very exciting to see, and um, and uh, we all keep our fingers crossed. Uh, of course, you know China's taken note of this too, <laughs> so they uh, so uh, they have to they have to sharpen their pencils and uh, and figure out how they're going to compete with the United States in in that way. Thank you, Bucky. That was really great, um, Eric. Uh, to you, and sort of diving off of what Bucky said with China. In the last few weeks and last week or so, I've seen a lot of articles and talking about, uh, you know, the Chinese continuing to steal our U.S. technologies and and basically, uh, in a sense, uh, why innovate if you're China, if you can get it for free from the U.S., right? And also, we're kind of doing foreign military sales without getting paid for, right? We're doing foreign military sales to China because we're not protecting our technology. Um, so... In, in that backdrop, I have two questions for you. One, how can we better secure our technology? And then two, uh, you know, you've you've been a big proponent of uh, speaking about, uh, you know, government uh, investment in S and T and R and D. Uh, you know, does that not stymie the private sector if we do that? So I'll let you choose whichever one you want to answer first. Those are super questions, Mayor. And so in the research and development community and we're, when we're working on science and technology we always have a balancing act between the the value of open collaboration with universities where you can uh, you get tremendous uh, that is the fastest way to innovate and you can build off of each other's ideas and and that's super valuable in the early stages of research and then as you get more towards operational capabilities and especially the vulnerabilities of those operational capabilities that's where you need to be more protective of your specific uh, implementation of, of what you've done. So it's a balancing act. There is no uh, there is no easy button to hit on protecting our technology, uh, but it's something we need to very actively think about and manage on a case by case basis. One of the things we're seeing though is uh, China's not just stealing our technology anymore because they are becoming the leaders in a number of technology areas in space, and that's why we're we're especially concerned that within the next decade. They could be, uh, you know, become the overall uh, space leader, and uh, and a and a and that it would not be a favorable outcome for the United States. So that was a theme that came out of the conference and the conference participants is that uh, China is not just following and copying us now with their their uh, eight times the number of PhDs that we have, uh, the the increased innovation and that and uh, creation of new knowledge that they have prioritized in their country. Uh, that that is how they will they envision uh, leapfrogging over us within the next 10 to 20 years to become the leader there. Now, what do we do about that? That's what this report is about. You know, the, the free market, there are advantages to their centralized planning and they're very deliberate and, and about what they choose to do. Uh, but the free market is both our greatest assets and our greatest potential vulnerabilities. So if you circle back to uh, why the importance of, of protecting the right things, but not too much to stifle innovation and the importance of our uh, government role in the market to be able to shape uh, the early uh, technology phase so that it's useful to us and so that those countries that are, are 
inventing new things, choose to stay in the United States and the, the United States is their flag of choice. Uh, those are our key roles in the government and that's our roadmap to success that's outlined in the report. Thank you, thank you, Eric, great. Um, Mandy, to you, so diving off of what Eric said to drill down a little bit, how are um, our space uh, related supply chain vulnerabilities impacting sort of the the U.S. space industrial base, you know, is it something to be concerned or is it something that's always going to be enduring? And did the workshop come out with any recommendations on that? No, and I think uh, I wanted to pile on to one thing Colonel Felt said, because I think he he's brings up a good point in terms of what's that balance as you're going through the S&T process. But I think some of it, too, is um, education back. To, to those new, especially the new entrants, right? So a lot of new companies, new startups, they may not be aware, they're not conditioned to understand kind of the, the, the baseline cyber and infrastructure vulnerabilities as they stand up a company. So I think that's one thing that's that's really good from, from this community, as well as kind of DIU's original mantra on how do we help educate a lot of these startups in terms of what are some easy things that they can do to shore themselves up even before they maybe move into the classified space on a program in their development. So I, I think there's, there's more to unpack there. Um, but then kind of to, to tip your question a little bit on, on kind of the other thing that Eric kind of started to mention here is that that the demand signal, and I will get back to kind of the supply chain bit, but that demand signal that Mike Brown even mentioned as well, the impact of that demand signal and that shows in for every prototype contract that DIU puts out, then there's this private money that comes back in. So I think there's one thing to really emphasize that shows the power of that demand signal and where I'd like to see that an action to come from this report and really in this group is how do we make sure that even those DIU prototype contracts are really linked to what Eric mentions, that those are the programs that really matter, that these are the capabilities that really fit into a larger roadmap um, that aligns with our national defense strategy. So I think there's some homework to be done here. Now, to get back to your real question on supply chain vulnerabilities. So my, my linkage with that national defense strategy, one of the, the kind of the number one item right now is integrated deterrence to the pacing threat of, of China. So the supply chain bit really falls into that integrated word, right? So I think there's a growing awareness in terms of, okay, we need to understand what are all of the economic vulnerabilities, um, how do we have faster communications between across this interagency process in terms of funding sources, uh, rare earth materials, singular supply chain vulnerabilities, et cetera, and what can we possibly do about it? Uh, so I think this is one thing too, again, for the industrial participants in this, in this survey, in this report, why this is so important, because we need to highlight where do maybe we don't realize that we we do have singular vulnerabilities in our supply chain so then how does that feed up into what can what can we do in a larger interagency process to create that that integrated deterrence posture so i'll just i'll pause that and curious what other panelists think about that too yeah if anybody has any opinions on that please chime in otherwise i'll go to my next question um John, this year, um, the Space Force uh, emphasized the need to build uh, relationships and integrate uh, allies and partners. We have a lot of uh, allies and partners that follow the Atlantic Council. Um, can you please tell us about how Space Force sort of envisions that, uh, env envisions how they're going to accomplish that? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I think first and foremost, you know, space is 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 vital to ev almost every facet of, of of our modern day life. That's not just in the United States, but that was our partner, friends, allies, and and, and really across the globe. And and what we've seen uh, underscored by uh, the Ukraine conflict is the absolute essential and critical nature uh, nature of, of 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 robust partnerships. And how uh, coming together um, can 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 achieve extraordinary results. And so I think as we look at that, the United States Space Force is is, is certainly dedicated to accessing and protecting and defending the space do domain. But we're doing so 
absolutely in partnership with our allies and partners and like-minded nations. And so uh, as we look at the economic health and national security ram ramifications of that, uh, it's essential. And same thing as we look at the integrated uh, if we look at the integrated deterrence posture, when we look at competition in the gray zone, that is all cyber and space uh, right now. And, and as we look at um, the, the, the evolution of the spectrum of conflict through crisis and, or, or you know, contingency and, and, and conflict and, and crisis, um, that, is, uh, that is ever more important. What are we doing within the Space Force? We're being active uh, in, in, in our engagement, in our communication. We're creating uh, vigorous, uh, and real partnerships at all levels. As we speak, the Chief of Space Operations is uh, currently uh, in Europe visiting with uh, several of our key partners there. And so that's just emblematic. I recently returned from um, the, the Indo-PACOM theater. And, and, and so that just highlights how important this is. And it is, when I say economic health and national security, it is the triumvirate. Because as we look at what we've just gone through uh, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the COVID and the supply chain challenges, we see that it is a connected and interconnected um, world, but one where um, we need to have the freedom of action. We need to have the freedom of, of like-minded liberal democracies, the rule of law, um, respect for, for, for rights and humankind um, going forward. We think we're the good people, the good team in this. And so um, it's very important to build those, uh, those partnerships. As we do so, um, you know, having a clear, crisp, uh, cogent uh, national vision, this North Star vision was something that the participants almost universally last year and this year highlighted as the most important imperative, the thing that um, despite and, 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 and being an integral part of the, of the apparatus at, at the headquarters level and working with the White House, um, there, is, there, there has, as we've outlined, been significant progress in this area, um, but there's more to do. We think that um, as, we, as we look at this amalgam of inputs, it's very compelling, and they gave us some actionable areas which, with, with which we can, uh, we can build on the important work and the, and, and the solid work that we've done. Uh, both as, as, as a Department of Defense, as the uh, United States Space Force, the, the Department of the Air Force uh, writ large, as well as NASA and the Department of Commerce. Uh, it, it, other elements uh, like uh, the interagency tapestry, looking at um, the, 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 the Department of, of Commerce and, and the importance of space traffic management, looking at the, uh, the FAA commercial space uh, flight office as we look at the velocity needing to increase in terms of licensure and policy and regulation. These are important enablers that allow our, our economy and our activities in space, um, not just for national security, but more importantly, from a whole uh, a whole of government approach, a whole of nation approach. Those allow us to accelerate and succeed and and and, and really uh, lead. And, and and you know it is uh, it is a a critically important time. We feel that temporal aspect as, as uh, Colonel Felt and, and, uh, and, and Mike Brown and you have outlined there, uh, that there are real and, and, and pressing concerns uh, in multiple areas. So in some ways, uh, I think the participants tried to highlight and underscore and footstomp to us uh, with very real and actionable elements uh, because we all feel this palpable sense of urgency of now and, and, and responding and acting and doing at the speed of need is what this is all about. And Mir, the first question you asked me was what's different about this year? And General Olson just hit on a, a few really key things. There are more details in there this year. This is the first year that we identified what the North Star vision should be in the report, the development and settlement of space. That is a effort, that, a vision that can endure for 100 years. It allows our country and our world and our to go after the economic benefits of space, and that's what the development piece is all about. And it acknowledges that eventually human settlement is a, is a key part of that vision. So that details in there. And then how do we partner with allies? Well, it talks about expanding the Artemis Accords, which have been very successful within NASA, beyond ju just NASA and making that more of a whole of government approach so that if on the DOD side, we have like a, a you know, a NATO for space or, or something uh, of that, uh, of those words, that would be under the umbrella of these larger Artemis Accords. So those additional details are really important. And those are things that were in there this year. Thank you, Eric, for filling Here, in. I, I, would, I would just follow up with that. Eric, Eric was spot on, but you know, the two themes, the dual themes for this year of sustainability and prosperity, those are universal human themes. Those are universal enduring themes as well. And you know, 
exactly with that North Star vision, with that grand strategy uh, call from the participants. Um, I think the focus on sustainability and, 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 and in particular, that has so many facets to it and the prosperity as, we, as we've seen the challenges with some of the inflationary and supply chain challenges that have been imbued. Um, this is, this is a, a really vital time, a historical inflection point to, uh, to, to, to really lead um, with speed. In those areas. And I agree. I agree with with what they both said, but uh, we'll just pile on that. Uh, while the report does do exactly as Colonel Felt said, it does dive into some more actionable, tangible details to, to General Olson's point, especially on the prosperity bit. Um, I think we kind of we lost some of the focus on some how do we link how do you do good and do well we lost some of the the specificity in terms of how do we link this part of the economy with the larger economy how do we bring all of our economic tools to bear what's the role of treasury what's the role of OMB um, into help making this stuff happen right because as Colonel Felt mentions that's quite a vision right? And there's a lot of analysis that shows in many ways the space economy is still developing. It's not really developed. So it needs bolstered in, in some different ways. So I think that's one area where um, how do we link it to the prosperity piece in terms of, of those economic tools to bring to bear? Uh, I might as well throw We're my two cents on this. So, uh, <laughs> and, then, and, we, and we can't do all of the above with a uh, policy that was crafted in 1962. <laughs> so we need, uh, we, we need, there's a cry uh, for help, both from the, from the commercial world and from the, the government world, uh, those of us who are trying to, uh, to deliver these great capabilities, that we, we, need, we need some attention from our, uh, from our policymakers and lawmakers uh, to bring, a, bring our policy into the 21st century so that we can compete uh, uh, fairly and responsibly and uh, and not be not be chasing uh, uh, tigers from a from a different century. That's perfect. No, thank you, um, Bucky. Back to you. Quick question on for international partners, right? And how do how do we? What's there's a need to integrate them into the, our national security ecosystem, right? In space and then also the derivatives or uh, the inputs into space. Are there any ideas out there or any efforts out there to focus on that? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, and the best part is that you see it across the entire spectrum of, uh, you know, uh, commercial space. There's no commercial space company that just wants to sell products in the United States. You know, they want to sell to the world um, in civil space. You know, you mentioned the Artemis Accords earlier. We're not just going to the moon uh, to plant the U.S. flag. We're going to the moon to bring uh, to bring our our allies and friends and create more spacefaring capacity uh, uh, for the good of the entire Earth. Um, and then on the on the military side, um, you know, not the Chinese people, but the People's Republic of China, you know, the Communist Party uh, with their own ideas, <laughs> they uh, they become a much smaller problem uh, when we when we have uh, when we're shoulder to shoulder with our friends and allies uh, uh, around the world. Uh, and that is not easy. You know, the, you know, diplomacy uh, takes uh, a long time and a lot of consistency. The wonderful thing is there's efforts across that whole spectrum. The Space Force has an amazing international uh, affairs office uh, that, uh, that is, is building relationships. Uh, and they, you know, they showcase it almost every year at the Space Symposium, which is an international venue. I think that... Uh, I, you know, we all have a very optimistic view for the future, but I, I think the, uh, where we need to be grounded is just say, look, you know, there are, there are, uh, there are agendas afoot uh, around, you know, and uh, especially from our uh, autocracy friends who, uh, who, um, who have a different a view of what the world's going to look like in uh, 20, 40, 50, 60 years. And, uh, and, uh, and it's our uh, responsibility now that we're out of COVID, I, I would very much like to uh, entertain the idea that we can actually have some more international participation in this workshop uh, so that we can work collectively, especially when we deal with issues like uh, sustainability and the, the environment. Uh, you know, because we all we're all on this uh, pale blue dot, uh, as Carl Sagan used to say, and we all we all share a vested uh, interest in the outcome of our ability to. Uh, to uh, you know, preserve the earth for generations to follow. 
Mandy, this question is kind of for you because uh, although Steve, uh, although Bucky's on the West Coast, uh, John and Eric are in the Pentagon. Outside of the Pentagon, uh, sometimes there's not this um, sense of urgency with the strategic competition with China, right? And I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal that the title was America's industrial base isn't ready for war with China. Um, you know, what do you see from your interactions with, you know, startups, uh, venture capital and efforts, and just, you know, you were running a company from your peers, are they just basically saying, hey, you guys are just, you know, in, in, inflating the threat so that you guys get more investments from the government or, or are they actually seeing the threat or is the, is the, or is that the reason why we need to declassify everything so that they see the threat for what it is, but then we should, we reveal all of our sources and methods and all of our planning. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that sort of to you to kind of address that from the private sector, if you don't mind. You know, it's, I think a lot of the people within the walls of, of the Pentagon would be really surprised at the sense of urgency that the private sector really has. And they're, they're desperate for information. They're desperate for information. And also like, how can, how can they help? Um, there's, there's venture capital firms, there's private equity firms, there's even public investors where you can see how they, they are, they want to participate in this sector and, and they just need a vector in terms of where to, where to go, what is the priority? And again, it kind of goes back to that overall linkage of the demand signal of, okay, where is the DOD, the national security space community really ready to leverage and, and pull and trust um, the companies and the data and the products that are being developed in this sector. Um, so I think that's one thing where from, it's kind of interesting to kind of watch the perceptions of both sides, um, but there's just a huge pent up almost frustration from the investment community that they want to participate and they understand that there's a role here and an understanding that, okay, there is time of the essence. And one of our last kind of unique things as the, the poll showed from, from the workshop, our innovation and our entrepreneurial baseline is kind of are our strengths. Um, so it kind of really goes back to, okay, not just to a DIU prototype effort, but how do we show an actual linkage, kind of like the NASA COTS program from the last 15 years? How do we show a real demand signal that if you get private investment into OSAM, ISAM, uh, these other these other new emerging bits of the of the cis lunar economy. How do we really show that there's no kidding? There's a there's some there's a billion dollar contract that you can bid on in a few years. So that'll help vector where a lot of that private money can can go. And then it also goes back into kind of again some of the financial engineering tools. Um, are there incentive structures? How do we again? Uh, this was also one of the the polls. How do we align those incentives? So even just a random investor that's playing with their mutual funds can can participate. Um, so there's there's a lot more we can bring to bear. And I think with the, within the Pentagon, it's it's a real education. And I've been very happy that like uh, the Honorable Heidi Shu and even even uh, the DepSecDef, they've had roundtables with investors and in more of these companies to try to learn and understand how, where are those pockets of, of real priority and how can we kind of align and really pull those those companies and this, this type of investment structure into the dialogue in a more meaningful way. Hey, Mir, uh, from, you know, from my perspective, having been uh, in industry for 10 years and then come back into the government, I came back to government precisely for the reasons Mandy mentioned. I think as we look at the challenges, imbuing the policy and, 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 and the, uh, those, those strategic policy decisions with the, you know, the, the, the business mindset, having, having the cultural awareness on both sides and the engagement of both is fundamentally important. If we, if, if we reference the, the, the report for this year, in the 2022 report, there's an industrial-based scorecard, and I would highlight that still yellow are markets, risk, incentives, cybersecurity, national supply chain, legislation, new starts, those reflect exactly what Mandy said, and I think they're important areas of focus and emphasis, emphasis because she, she was spot on. Innovation 
in our entrepreneurial spirit and the diversity um, and, 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 and the vigor of the inputs from that side of the equation are fundamentally important. But I think there are also important recommendations in here that we listen to and we can be enlightened by and informed by in terms of catalytic things that have worked in the past uh, that are resonant with industry, things that can be done in terms of indemnification, in terms of legislation, in terms of risk posture, in terms of incentive structures. Um, all of those, I think, are fertile, too detailed to walk through here, but that's why it's worthy of diving into this report, looking at not just the, the, the amalgam and summaries in the report, but also diving into some of the backup information, because the richness of the dialogue and the inputs were uh, what make this what, what makes this special. And I think as you look at as, as you look at us, we're listed as authors, but we're really stewards more uh, because the real work is done by Peter Gerritsen as an editor to bring the incredible work that all these participants at the workshops have done. But this is their voice is amplified. And so these are these are almost siren calls to say, hey, help us out here. We are engaged, but we, you know, we are stressed or challenged in these arenas. And so it's a cooperate and graduate mentality. So if I could add to that, it, uh, we, we draw on, on historical uh, you know, references, uh, Apollo, um, in previous reports, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. And, and we did this to show the power of a nation when we operate as a whole of nation, not as NASA, not as DOD, not, not as a couple of companies uh, who are really hyper-focused on space, but what happens when we mobilize the nation, as Mike Brown was talking about, uh, in, in his childhood, and it's it's not just that school teachers are 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 part of the solution, and um, a, as well as uh, the industrial base, uh, the bureaucracy. I mean, you know, uh, we're, we you know we beat up pretty heavy on on the on the on on the government. Not at the top. The top gets it. They're they're like leaders, and they're leading us forward. But you know, the the Titanic in the middle is is, uh, is still living in 1962. And it's a comfortable place, but you know, if, uh, incentives have to go beyond uh, the commercial side. It has to go into the government space, and so that so we can get timely action on things. And you know, uh, time is money on on, on the commercial side, and, and um, uh, we have to have more appreciation for that as we bring more commercial capabilities into areas like uh, civil and national security space. Uh, so that uh, uh, and this whole notion of dual use technology. Uh, so that uh, we want we want to lead economically. Uh, uh, great, uh, one of those great reference points. If you think about uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, at the at the beginning of eighteen hundreds, what's amazing about that that was an exploratory effort. And six six decades later, we're dropping the golden spike uh, connecting the transcontinental railroad. Six decades. Apollo was our exploration moment, our Lewis and Clark moment on the moon. And we're six decades later, and we're starting to see the uh, the uh, the uh, um, uh, analogous golden spike going in, into the uh, space economy. And we need to keep that going because uh, in the Apollo era, we went, we didn't perceive all the great technologies and new markets that were going to come from uh, that kind of focus on on a on a national objective. Uh, semiconductors, you know, information technology, materials, uh, the list is endless. Uh, so and and th those things are still meaningful today. So the uh, so I, I think how, you know the not just what we do but how we do it and um, and if we get not just whole nation but our allies and partners uh, in that mix as well and and we really lean forward in space uh, economically, scientifically, and and technologically with the goals that that Eric mentioned. You know, economic development, human settlement in space. That solves a lot of problems uh, beyond just the, you know, the uh, autocrat problem. It really helps us uh, make us more sustainable in terms of the Earth environment going industrializing space, which is already an extreme environment. And so the, we can have uh, preserved the Earth. Uh, th these are um, great insights from industry. And we really encourage you all to read the report and, uh, and give us your feedback and join us next year. It'll be a lot of fun. Thank you, Bucky. Um, um, as we round out to go to audience questions, um, we've already discussed North Star and a few other of the recommendations. Was is, just briefly mention one recommendation that really impressed you, or uh, maybe you know 
you saw a unanimous uh, agreement on that you didn't expect or something like that, just so that when the readers go in, they pay a little bit more attention to that, um, if you don't mind. Was that directed at me? No, that's directed to everybody. Okay, good. <laughs> Hey, I really liked the the recommendation that to save the planet, you have to get off the planet. That was a key insight in that, you know, by by developing space and the new technologies that will come with that, like solar power beaming and and mining and moving heavy industry to space, that those are ways that we can save the the, the Earth. And so that connection is something that is very powerful. If we can get the, get those messages out there, that's the kind of motivation that's going to really energize the space, the multi-trillion dollar space economy of the future. So that one really struck me as awesome. I think one whole section of recommendations that struck me as awesome, having recently been at a launch company, was the maturation and definitization of a real actionable plan from the launch sector on how do we make this a more robust, more integrated with airspace, more responsive, more global, more allied um, part of the industry for access to space. So I thought that was a good set of recommendations, very actionable. And then the one area of recommendations that I didn't see as globally as I kind of expected is how to deal with some of the security issues, not just over classification or under classification, but how do we fundamentally think about making it easier um, a kind of across the board for new entrants? How do we have these architectural discussions? What is that balance? I, I was underwhelmed that there wasn't more tangible recommendations on that front. Yeah, I would build on that too. I think those are both excellent and I share the same, um, but I, I think from the sense of, of, of purchasing of commercial services and engagement on that side, I think there are some real hurdles there. You know, we have an overclassification challenge that's well known. General Heighton, I think was the largest champion of that. Um, we also have some challenges with funding stability and, and, and uh, uh, some of the requirements efforts, but those are, those are known and those, uh, th those, those are not new, but certainly reinforced, but there, there were, there were, uh, there were siren calls and, 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 and compelling uh, desires to uh, accelerate and expand the use of commercial services. Of course, our hybrid space architecture with both digital and physical and, and commercial and government systems is already in being embodied in that. And I think the, the Space Development Agency uh, and the uh, Tron Zero and One highlight uh, new ways of thinking and doing that. But I think much more broadly across the entire spectrum um, from both the national security to the economic, to the exploration, to the science, um, and, and everywhere in between, I think that is that is very true. I think uh, that will be uh, we, we you know we, we will be the beneficiaries of even more knowledge and input. And I think as we look and shape our our, our workshops going forward, uh, having specific action focused, how can we do that? How can we eliminate pain points or hurdles or challenges um, that was both rich and compelling in this. Um, but we need more. The more that we can do, the more we can reflect that in policy and practice. And 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 in our processes, uh, because we're all in this together. Again, I think as we look at the nexus of, of 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 spending, it's been extraordinary as we see this explosive growth. But we've also seen a little bit of froth in the SPAC, uh, in, in 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 some of the SPAC, uh, uh, you know, retractions there. And and I think as we look at um, the fact that 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 critical uh, organic U.S. onshoring, uh, the, the critical supply chain in not only the constituents like rare earths and, 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 and platinum group and other uh, key uh, capacities like uh, semiconductors and, and constituent materials um, to the broader capabilities at an integrated and system of systems level. All those are important. We've seen the challenges through COVID and the supply chain challenges, how important that is. But again, back to that international partnerships. And the more we can forge those and have um, real actionable things to apply, getting beyond just the rhetoric and the pomp and circumstance to the real, uh, the real productive outputs, that is the awesomeness. Over. Thank you all. I'll just add that, uh, uh, if I could, just one more thing, which is that uh, the surveys were incredible. And in fact, one of the ones I think Eric led is it's not just what we're doing, but some time dependencies of it, that the, the industrial base was very apt at telling us, here's things that you should be able to do with a stroke of a pen. In other words, what, things we could do nearly immediately, like elevating the office of space commerce, 
or uh, or uh, uh, authorizing the space force to have a uh, uh, a special fund for get, enabling reimbursements for commercial expenditures at the launch facilities. These things can be done in a very immediately and have great impact. And then there's other things that are more deliberate. They re that require a little more time and to carefully evolve. And um, and that level of detail is really great because then you can prioritize things uh, in, in terms of near term, mid term, and long term. Uh, it really, uh, really uh, great contributions from from all the participants in that in doing that. Thank you. I'll appreciate that uh, those feedback. Um, I'm going to switch now to uh, have Julia uh, field some questions from the audience with you, and I'm going to get off uh, the camera. So, Julia, welcome. Thanks, Mir. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, a really interesting discussion and report. Um, to the audience, if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the Zoom Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you include your name and affiliation, we'll try to get to as many as we can um, in the next uh, 10 or so minutes. So I'll start with a question on transatlantic relations, uh, given this is a topic we're often focused on at the Atlantic Council. Uh, Khalid Abuzar from Barbicane Space asks, in competing with China and Russia, how important is the transatlantic relation um, when it comes to space? For example, how is the US space supply chain connected to Europe? Um, where are we or where should we be relying on our allies and partners? Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that one broadly to the group in case anybody wants to chime in. I could lead off with one of the uh, most interesting things you're going to see this fall is um, uh, uh, one of the small launch companies, uh, uh, Virgin Orbit, is uh, is going to launch uh, for the Queen's Jubilee out of uh, out of England and, uh, and delivering uh, uh, some uh, some hardware uh, to space and uh, and there's a fervor over that and in, in the UK it's awesome because uh, they're they're uh, they're participating uh, in uh, in this. Uh, exciting uh, commercial space era so and of course you know the, the united states uh space force is actually partnering and in, in enabling that so which is which is great so those are uh, and there's uh uh other great examples uh uh around the world i think we've we highlight some of those in, in, a, in a report but uh, i'll just offer that one and i'll follow up very quickly i would say absolutely emphatically yes the transatlantic partnership is 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 fundamentally important to us uh, it is uh, it is necessary, but not sufficient, though, as we look at the global view and certainly the focus, but a a absolutely. And, and, and for that reason, General Raymond, as I mentioned previously, is, is engaged there. He'll, uh, for security reasons, I won't say where he's going, but uh, uh, he is he is definitely engaged. And, you know, this is not just at a, at a governmental level. It's at the industry and collaborative partnership level there, as well as the non-governmental. I think all that ecosystem is fundamentally important to make this uh, go. And so as we uh, as we more uh, vigorously stitch those elements together and, and, and we see the rich outcomes, as we mentioned, commercial space has been an extraordinary uh, enabler for uh, the, the Ukraine uh, conflict, whether that be from an imagery and change detection perspective, from electro-optical to synthetic aperture radar, uh, to uh, comms and data and connectivity. And if we look at the end, uh, that is really what it's all about. I think as we start looking at the energy ramifications and much more broader uh, you know, food and shipping elements, um, it, it, it just underscores how critical space is to every part of our daily lives and to the global world order, but how critical it is to our national security and integrated deterrence. Great. Thank you. Um, and kind of a related question just on how the United States works with um, both its allies, but also the private sector. Um, so Bella Grabowski from Intelsat US asks, Compared to other nations, the U.S. is often views, viewed as decentralized um, or overregulated, especially as it pertains to space policy and foreign investment. How can we strike the right balance between regulation and overregulation in the space domain? Um, what can be done to encourage partnerships and investment while also protecting domestic priorities? Uh, Colonel Fell, um, would you like to start on this one, given your role in space acquisitions? Sure. Those are some. Uh, those are super important questions that we grapple with every day as we're trying to work with uh, commercial, new commercial partners, especially with international partners, as we've already already talked about. And again, I would say there are no. There's no easy button here. Uh, this just requires diligent thought on a case by case basis, as you and education of each of the people that you have to work with. And there are competing 
uh, interests that have to be balanced uh, on, on, in those veins. So um, uh, I, I think that that uh, that we have a number of ways to help commercial companies uh, through that that part of the effort. Uh, but I think we also need to do more. And that was some of the feedback we got from the industry at the event was that, uh, yes, thank you for what you're doing, but um, if we want to beat China in technology, it is not enough. And so that, uh, I think, is one of the areas where it's not enough. And I'll just chime in to add that, you know, clearly this is a, an area of emphasis for the overall interagency processes. Uh, the Space Council has announced that kind of revamping kind of the commercial space rules framework is one of their next priorities. So, no, as, as Colonel Felt mentioned, it's no easy button, um, but I think one that we everybody acknowledges needs a, a serious relook and a refresh. I think, you know, we swim in these waters all the time <laughs> at DIU because uh, we work with uh, non traditional companies and. And uh, I think the most important thing, it's it's not just about, um, you know, we, at DIU, we like to say we build relationships on trust. And uh, and I, I think the most important thing there is it's not just about what are you doing for the government, but, you know, what can the government be doing for you? And and I think that uh, having a productive, more transparent discussions about how, how companies can protect their intellectual property, um, their, their networks, uh, you know, their um, the integrity of, of their workforce. Uh, the, there's lots of different uh, vulnerabilities uh, when you when you have uh, capabilities that can be very disruptive um, in in the national security context. So uh, I we I really have to applaud though uh, uh, relationships we have with folks, uh, including uh, Scipius and others. Uh, they have a very tough job, but they're but they're not unapproachable. In fact, uh, uh, there's more dialogue. Um, Going across the spectrum, but the report, though, what the report really identifies is that we have to be more responsive, uh, especially with respect to licensing. And you know, can we do agile policy or agile licensing? What you know, it's like we it, it can't take uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, the lifespan of of of, of a of dog you know to uh, to get uh, a license uh, to launch a rocket when you've iterated uh, three rockets ahead of the one that you were going to launch, and so. So we have to we have to balance all these things, uh, not compromise safety, I, and that's uh, uh, that's that's very important. But we have to we have to find ways to uh, to innovate and and move at commercial speed, uh, which is really the way that we uh, move fast and secure our future. Thanks. Um, and it isn't, by the way, it isn't just the private sector that needs those processes fixed. At AFRL, I mean, <laughs> I had to pull satellites off the launch vehicle because I didn't have the frequency license in time to, mm -hmm. to launch a satellite. Uh, we, As we build out the, the mega constellations of proliferate LEO in particular, we still are faced with the same old processes from 1962 that are holding us back. So it's not the technology that's limiting the pace of innovation in many cases. It's the, it's the walking through molasses every day, and that is on the government government side and on the commercial side. So those are things we can work on together going forward. Thanks. Um, and kind of a similar question, but focused on mid and small size companies. Um, so these companies are producing innovative technologies, but cannot wait for the lengthy PPBE process um, to receive this critical funding that they need, um, thus perishing in the valley of death. Uh, how can DOD support these companies specifically? Uh, this is a question from Jeffrey Todd. Bucky, I might turn to you first, given your comments just now and earlier on yeah. uh, the three tiers of innovation. So we've been doing our uh, normal snarky uh, poking at 1962, which is when, you know, uh, 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 you know, Secretary of Defense McNamara kind of introduced uh, the the uh, the PBBS, you know, which is, you know, basically this whole idea of how we uh, plan, program and execute budgets for national security and defense. And um and uh, it's been an experiment that's just been like gum on our shoe. Uh, you know, all it was, you know, may have been great then, but uh, our inability to change it uh, significantly since then is is really um, it, it's really an Achilles Achilles heel for uh, for the nation. And uh, but the good news is uh, the um, there's a, a a committee, a special committee established by Congress that's looking at this and taking inputs, and uh, and they're doing the same thing that we did with the industrial base for space. They're going to the uh, the entire uh, 
industrial base uh, and 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 others looking at inputs for how to how to improve that process. Uh, and really, the key thing is whether you're a service secretary or in the case of like Space Force uh, General Raymond, um, you, you don't get those positions if if you're not trusted and trustworthy. I mean, these are highly experienced people who, quite frankly, would make a lot more money on the outside than in the government. So, but uh, uh, they 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 need the flexibility to make decisions on a uh, that are critical in a timely manner. Otherwise, it it could take three years to get to get new dollars to start uh, new efforts that that the nation really needs, and and uh, and so uh, those people will be much more articulate about about the way ahead. But it, it's great to see that the industrial base also recognizes, uh, you know, the 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 problem of of living in Easter year's uh, you know policy environment. I would offer too, the best thing about this report from a DOD perspective is that it tells us the number one thing we need to do is buy more commercial stuff faster. And the reason is, is that the, the commercial offerings are changing every day and there's always new capabilities coming in space. And we, a lot of those are potentially useful to the DOD. So we should buy a little bit of those and experiment with them quickly and then buy more of the things that, are, that show they have value to us so that we can quickly in, operationalize them and bring them in, uh, into the hybrid resilient architecture. So that's clearly the vision of what we need to do. And we have some roadmap of how to get there. Things like a working capital fund, things like um, a treat, buying these as services rather than as development projects or ideas that are out there that will enable us to not, uh, the, one of the participants talked about how it's it's great with all the, the cyber and innovation funding, you help us race to the valley of death sooner. That is not the goal. The goal is to uh, is to not have the valley of death. And the way that you get that is by this incremental it additional purchasing of commercial services. And the report also identifies 20% uh, of the budget as a, as a goal for how much commercial services we should be able to buy, given the immense offerings that are out there now, and how much more resilient that will enable us to be with the hybrid architecture, and more agile in responding to threats, and more agile in adopting new technologies. So that's why that recommendation is so important from the for the DoD and the Space Force. And we're building on that. You know, of course, we placed Eric now at our staff SQ up at the Office of the Undersecretary for Acquisition uh, and, and, and Integration. I think that's vitally important. You know, DIU exists, AFWorks, SpaceWorks. These are important elements. We're also allocating money to bridge those valleys of death. So we're listening and we're trying to be responsive. But this is a team sport and it's one that we got to continue to look at and refine because those small and mid-tier uh, companies. That's where the true uh, genius, the true innovation and, 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 the, and the true disruptive capabilities are. Uh, we also need to leverage both traditional and non-traditional, and it's much more broad than the space sector. I'm currently here at MIT Lincoln Labs. We're hosting the, the Department of the Air Force's first data and AI forum. And, and, and that is a vital integral part as we look at the digital engineering ecosystem and digital operations in our digital headquarters for the planning, programming and budgeting systems. These are how we'll work with in, 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 in that model-based systems engineering, that agile software development, that dead suck ops approach, whether it be for data or whether it be cyber or AI, all those elements are part of the broader ecosystem. That's what I love about the richness and diversity, the inputs to this is we have that broad spectrum, but we need even more. I think that, you know, we have a tendency to be a, a little bit breathing of our own exhaust in the space community. And I think we need to look at that broad, uh, that broad integrated multidisciplinary spectrum. And that is what's going to ignite um, the, the leadership and, 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 the, and the evolution and the success that we all seek. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're just about at time. So I'm going to start, turn over to uh, Steve Grunman to close this out. Steve, over to you. OK, thanks uh, to all of you. I, I think the, uh, if I may, the, the energy, uh, the leaning forward, practical uh, nature of the conversation you've just heard uh, tells you all you need to know, both about this report, uh, but, but also about the great imperatives uh, of uh, improving the space industrial base and, and, and leveraging it, um, which I think are, are, are maybe the two, uh, at least two of the themes that I heard from this conversation uh, we could read in that report, which again, I, I commend to all of you to do. Um, you can do that at a, a, through a link at DIU. Um, and again, if nothing more, uh, nothing else, I, I think this conversation, I hope this conversation 
uh, motivates many, many of you to go uh, download that report. There are there's a whole bunch of things in it that we haven't even had time to talk about in these 90 minutes. Allow me to just pound the table on on one that may have sounded way too arcane, but is hugely important and interesting and innovative. And that was the formation of a working capital fund um, to motivate the engagement of um, of uh, the, the the entrepreneurial and and uh, private commercial sector uh, with our national security problems. Um, it may sound a little arcane, but it's it's awfully clever and powerful um, if if we could do it. Just as one example uh, of of dozens of uh, ideas and recommendations, uh, which the report reflects off of the workshop that it built. Um, I have only left uh, a couple things. I want to thank everyone. Obviously, I want to thank the panel, Mir, Mandy, Eric, Bucky, John. Uh, thanks very much, um, both for your work, those of you who were authors, co-authors of this report, and for coming here this afternoon and presenting it to us, and, and to Mandy for, if you will, offering industry's voice on, on the matter, uh, though I think you are deeply implicated in this report, whether you're a co-author or not, I'm afraid, Mandy. Um, I want to uh, thank a couple of people, one of whom was on camera, one of whom was not. Uh, I think we might think of the two of them as the uh, behind the scenes orchestrator of this event. They are my colleague, Julia Siegel, uh, but also at DIU, Joanna Spangenberg-Jones. Um, thank you to the both of them, uh, uh, without whose efforts this event would not have come off. Um, I don't want to overlook, of course, thanking Mike Brown, um, again, both for uh, being here, uh, giving his keynote remarks for lending DIU's leadership to this effort and for his service to, to the U.S. government over the last uh, six years. We all owe a great uh, debt of gratitude to him for all of those contributions, including the, the most easiest of them, uh, which was probably showing up today and um, adding his comments to uh, what we had to do. Um, I'm going to close uh, by just mentioning a couple things back to the Atlantic Council uh, that we have done most recently in respect to space, since I've got this space-interested audience here. Uh, I want to draw to your attention uh, a couple of reports that Julia is going to um, post into the chat. Uh, we issued a report in May on small sats, uh, the implications for national security uh, by Nick F. Um, and then I've already mentioned uh, a report that Mir and Julia are the co-authors of, Space Traffic Management, A Time for Action. Um, that paper uh, was issued at the end of July, but we will formally launch it at an event like this on the 14th of September that I hope all of you will be on the lookout for. I also will mention that um, uh, the Scowcroft Center is has been commissioned to develop and, and publish a series of memos over the next year uh, about one of the very topics that came up in this conversation most, especially harnessing allies and its capabilities uh, for exploration, commercial, and security purposes. Um, so there will be more on that topic uh, coming forth from uh, my very own Atlantic Council. All right, everyone, I apologize. We're a couple minutes over, uh, but I, I, I think the topic warranted maybe a couple extra minutes. Thanks very much. Uh, congratulations to those of you uh, launching the report today. Thanks to the audience for joining us.